Okay. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us here on this cold Sunday for our artist talk. Today, we are presenting Human Nature, and it's an artist talk. And we're going to introduce our curator, Narang Tinta Music. Um, he is an artist, curator, and art collector based in Dallas, Texas. He obtained his biology undergraduate degree from the University of Texas at Dallas with a minor in visual arts. He is exhibited in solo and group shows locally in Dallas and beyond, including New York, Canada, and Germany. In August 2020, he started MUSIC, a virtual curatorial platform that offers solo exhibitions to artists without gallery representation through an invitational and open calls. Their current show, Human Nature, will be on um, view at the Fort Worth Community Arts Center through Saturday, the 16th of January. So without delay, I'm going to turn it over to you, Nerang. Thank you all for being here. Thank you so much, Marla, for, for the introduction. And I appreciate everyone here joining in human nature. I'm going to have a PowerPoint presentation for the talk. And I'm going to have to share my screen. So before we start our artist talk, I just want to thank some very special people and organizations. Probably to thank for World Community Art Center for their generosity in hosting our exhibitions. I would say a special thank you to program and exhibition manager Gio Giovanni Balderas, Art Center Director Marla Klishman Oven, Admin Assistant Tori Ortiz, Public Engagement Manager Elena Greer. I'd also like to thank the amazing in installation staff and all other members of Fort Worth Art Center that work behind the scenes who are, we haven't met that may, will help realize this exhibition. I would like to thank House of Iconoclasts and their creative director, Natalie Price, for giving me this opportunity to have an exhibit within their collective takeover show. And I also thank the amazing artists for their energy and dedication, Lene bowman Cravens, ba Molly Valentine Dirks, Carla Garcia, Doug Land, and Madeline Ortega. So this is going to be our agenda for the talk. So first, we're going to do the curatorial scope and the 3D exhibition walkthrough. We're going to, then we're going to head straight into the artist talks by Doug Land, Malin Ortega, Carla Garcia, Molly Beltran Dirks, Lene Bowman Cravens, and then we're going to have a Q&A from the audience. So if you got any questions for the artists or for myself, please enter your questions in the chat box, drop box, and then we'll either gonna either um, answer the questions during the talk or during the, our dedicated Q and A section. Okay, so what is human nature about? So human nature is about artworks that are sculptural and use a lot of installation works that talked about humanity through images of nature. I thought I was inspired by this theme because I think during 2020, it was a lot of social political upheaval. There was a lot of things going on with, with COVID and we really couldn't really have a great interaction between people. So a lot of the works did come out from that year were, were figurative, they mainly addressed those kind of issues. But I think we didn't really focus on too much about works that are that make us feel calm and serene. And a lot of things we did that we had to replenish ourselves. So humans really looked into nature to for that serenity. And I think a lot of artworks nowadays kind of not focus on nature. I kind of wanted to focus on things that were kind of in the background, in the shadows, but always been there with us. And surprisingly, I read this article on Artsy. Artsy is just a website that sells artwork, but also have like great editorials. And in 2021, they think that the trend will be a return to nature. And in the article, they said that because of this whole situation with COVID and this relationships so socially and politically have been so convoluted, that people just want to go outside and experience things that are beyond these social in infrastructures. So RC said, we're gonna, there's going to be a trend in art that in 21, there'll be a lot of things talked about nature. So kudos to the artists. Y'all yeah, been doing this before before it, it is in vogue. So that's great. 
And now we have this 3D, 3D, 3D walkthrough created by our very own Lene book, Bowman Cravens. And I'm going to show y'all the 3D walkthrough right now. So here is our 3D walkthrough. And in front of me, it's the entrance from Fort Worth Community Arts Center. And once you head from the, from come up the door, you make a left. And this is human nature right here. It kind of closes to the gift shop. And to my left, we have, left and right, we have installation by Doug Land. As you walk in, then you're gonna have these two pieces here on the wall and on two piece, one piece on the floor here and one piece on the wall is by Malin Ortega. As you kind of go straight here, you have pieces by Molly Valentine Dirks. And then on to the left, you have this cacti installation by Carla Garcia. Again, Molly's pieces on the right and Carla's on the left. And to the tourists at the very end of the exhibit, we have installation by Lene Bowman Cravens. She had these mirror pieces here and some um, hanging fabric pieces in addition to these origami works here. So I'm going to transition back to the PowerPoint. And we're gonna go straight right into our artist talk. So our first artist is Doug Land. Doug Land is a sculptor who is inspired by the functions and form of nature. He's currently pursuing an MFA in sculpture from TCU. Working in multiple mediums, he is considerate of the material source, its function, its lifespan, and the effects of time on the work. As a result, some works are made to be permanent, while other works are ongoing and some are ephemeral. Hi, Doug. <laughs> Hello. So Doug, could you please tell me more about this installation? Um, I absolutely think this, that this was just like a reaction to the, the looming elephant in the room, which is COVID and I was thinking, I've, I've also been watching a lot of uh, ancient history documentaries, especially with um, sort of all the new ones about these different Egyptian tombs. Um, and I, this idea that um, the Egyptians had where you would mummify yourself so that uh, in this, this next life, you would have um, all the tools you needed to continue living, to live in paradise. Um, and in one of the documentaries, they talked about how the hieroglyphs on the tombs weren't um, necessarily, um, they're more like magic spells toting the accomplishments of the person who had died. And so for me, this installation was about this fictitious gardener named Ghost Die. I have no idea how I got there. I think I thought I had maybe like a cataract in my eye. Maybe that was the, the idea of it. Um, and so Ghost Eye the Gardener, the hieroglyphs in the background all talk about um, his, you know, great ability to grow and, you know, he can mend fences and he can also shoo away crows. Um, and so you can see that little figure where it looks like an eyeball and two little horns and two little teeth. That's, that's the name of the gardener who's also decomposing in the box. Um, so in the box or in the coffin, however you want to refer to it, um, it's... It's sawdust, um, let's see, sawdust and I believe bread flour. Um, and so I have been composting all summer trying to figure out, you know, best practices. And I thought, wow, I've, I've been curious, not from a morbid stance, but from like a um, artistic stance, like how far you could kind of take that, you know, Damien Hurst had his like rotting cow heads. And I was like, is there some other way to present this idea of um, the cycle of life without it being so morbid and full of flies. Um, and so the seeds at the bottom are sort of all um, the seeds that could be taken into the next life, even in the jars, instead of representing organs, I was thinking about these forms of seeds. Um, there's pumpkin seeds, you know, there's the different seeds who 
have their own properties for different parts of the body. Um, and I thought that this whole idea of kind of spinning off of what the Egyptians had built all these thousands of years of religion around, could I take that same idea and play with it through the, the portal of the garden? Could I make objects um, purposely compose themselves as part of the process? Um, I think my only guilt is that I had to use vinyl um, decals on the back wall just because I couldn't figure out how to get um, enough stencils. I think there are like 88 different symbols uh, represented between the two walls. Um, and they all have their own sort of symbolic meaning. Um, they're all categorized. It's, it's a whole hieroglyphic set that I've developed uh, probably accidentally in the course of making this installation. Okay, Doug. Um, I just want to commend you on you know how well thought out the works are because you really thought you had this rake that you kind of cut off from the branches from a tree and you made yourself and you had these hieroglyphics these jars, this box of seeds. I think it's, it's just a lot of like thought process. You had to go through with all different items. And it's kind of like, almost like a set on a stage. You really had to, it was just, I just was so profound by how much you had to put into this. I had a question with the hieroglyphics. So can you tell us more about the process? You kind of, you kind of told me that you, you cut these out without much thought into it. Can you explain more about these, how you did these? Um, it started early, probably when I got back to grad school this semester. I didn't know what I was doing in my studio. It's, it had been a while since we had been back there. And there was a pile of these black post-it notes that were left by, I think, in the common area. And I thought, oh, this is fun. These are like little silhouettes. And so I started kind of mindlessly cutting things, cutting leaf forms. Um, and then I was cutting kind of just 10 a day just seeing what comes out and you know as artists I think we have like our go-to shapes our go-to ideas and then once we exhaust those ideas what comes next and I was really curious about how far I could push um, this idea of like limiting myself to only things that happen in the garden and thinking about my like my walks through when I go and like harvest things when I go to plant things but there were, the, there were these weird things that would come up, like um, I have a set of characters, kind of like this ghost die, where they're just strange. They don't belong in the garden. And so they kind of stood out. Um, and so I think I have, even though there's 88 in the show, I think I'm inching close towards 200 symbols. And so I take them, I scan them in the computer, I convert them into, um, uh, illustrator files so that they're like vector graphics so I can stretch them but I tried to keep them really close to the original scale which is like a three inch post-it note and um, I just started kind of arranging them to see like first I started organizing okay I have a whole bunch of flowers and I have a whole bunch of birds and I have a whole bunch of tools and what sense does that make after a while and that's kind of how I ended up here I just, I, didn't really, I just really like the hieroglyphic. I think because you had, you kind of had this like ancient, ancient burial site too, but you, I think because of the vinyl and the way you, you so the sort of like computer or digital graphic wise. So I think I like the, this, this high low feel when you have this something old and new. It's so it kind of between that midway. And I, I thought how I interpreted the works, it's kind of you just want to celebrate the gardeners and hunters of the past and want to say this is where we kind of came from but at the same time when we're looking at these things it's almost like we're we're just so far removed from our history that we couldn't really it's almost feel like foreign to us like what is these items i kind of want to shift focus to these totemic things on the left hand side picture here so what, why, why do you want to have these kind of like totem things and you have these like bureau sites? Do you have any like thoughts uh, on those? Yeah, they, you know, if you're gonna have a proper Egyptian tomb, um, you gotta have your Coptic jars. And that's absolutely what they were. We're just, um, I, I had been thinking about this kind of like religious conversion of like, how would, um, like, how would this Egyptian sort of religion sit in the, the realm of the garden it's like 
this Shangri-La man, this imaginary place. So it's like, I think you have to have your four protectors of death. And so what are the four protectors of the garden? Well, you have your, um, oddly enough, you have your snake, you have your bug or your spider, you have your bird, and then you also have clouds. You know, clouds offer rain, they offer shade. And so I sort of thought about these as A, symbols, and B, as kind of like these floating, repeating characters. Um, and so I've tried to make sure that I only use them on the Copic jars and at the end of this, like, each of these verses about uh, the character ghost eye. So inside is, you know, the seeds, um, you know, are, some are plantable, some are edible. Um, and like, you know, the, the parts of the gardener who is, you know, obviously deceased, they go into these jars and then from there his, whoever comes next uh, plants and sort of grows them again. And I think the title of the piece was like uh, Garden Rituals Endlessly Renewed. And so that was that ruminating idea of how things could be endlessly renewed. Like, how could I grow the leaves to, you know, fill in the coffin? How could I, you know, create the, the life of the gardener over and over and over again? So for the seeds, you can buy the seeds from the gift shop, by the way, because Doug had this selection of seeds. But I want to focus on... Is there a significance with the types of seeds you select on display? The type of like seeds you're offering, is there like a significance to you? Uh, yeah, so the ones in the box, um, the box was from a like an installation from, from a previous thing I had done at school, trying to see if I could get people to uh, take the seeds with them as this process of like going out and just scattering wildflower seeds. And so the box is filled with nothing but what like Texas native wildflower seeds from this vendor who's very specific um, about what they use. Um, and so it was like, that's the, the base of the garden. That's like the underworld. And then what's for sale in the gift shop are um, a lot of uh, sort of vegetable crops. And I think a couple of like flower crops too. Um, I mean, the, ultimately the goal I'm trying to get is for people to just grow seeds. So I try and put out the easiest things where they can just accidentally fall on the ground and grow. And so it's, it's a little bit of, uh, it almost feels like missionary work in a way where I'm trying to get people to buy into this idea with me of like, look, look at the garden, look how fun it could be. Oh yeah, come to church, give me those thighs, plant some seeds. And I remember those days, it's just, it's just really fun, but I just never really got into the gardening. I think it was fun when I was young, but I think the green thumb kind of died down when, when other things in life you come into play when you're an adult. But I appreciate it a lot, Doug, for promoting gardening, offering us your viewpoint uh, with, with this work. Thank you so much, Doug. No problem, thank you. And now I would like to transition to Madeline Ortega. Madeline Ortega is an interdisciplinary artist living in Euless, Texas, who graduated with a BFA in glass at the University of Texas of Arlington and is currently pursuing an MFA at TCU. Recently, her work has focused on the relationship between society, the environment, and how her heritage influences her personal collection to the natural Social connection to the natural world. Due to these interests, she, in she integrates various materials with plant matter in order to create work about her background and being a product of European colonizers and indigenous peoples. Hi, Maddie. Hi. Okay, Maddie, I know we have two works here. You have one kind of on the wall and one on the floor, but can you just, just give us a general overview of the, your total installation. Yeah, sure. So I'll start with the one on the wall, which you can see here. Um, I titled this one Burdened, and it incorporates iris plants, arrowheads, and a wooden shelf. Um, the iris plants I cultivated from my mom's house, and they've been passed down in my family since they naturalize and reproduce over time. And so the significance of them to me is not only that heirloom aspect and them being in my family for a long period of time, but also the significance of them being a plant that is not native to the United States 
And so for me, they symbolize the European side of my background. Um, since they're not a native plant, they have been naturalized in the United States and now they can continue to grow um, over time and reproduce, which is something that's interesting to me because they can um, over time morph into a different variety of plant. And to contrast that naturalized sense of the plant, I incorporated arrowheads, which represents the indigenous side of my background. And so this piece was an attempt to completely suspend the irises onto the wall with arrowheads, which in this case is a failed attempt at that, but it's still interesting to me because this piece won't always be successful in being able to completely suspend the irises on the wall in that way. And so in essence, the piece is a physical expression of my struggle and my identity as having come from such a violent era of history and something that still affects people to this day, including myself who come from both sides of this background and how that you know, carries with me on a day-to-day -day basis. And then the next piece, uh, the floor one, is incorporates the same iris plants that I took from, this time I believe these are from my grandma's house, but it's actually my mom's mom. So that's still the same variety of plant from the same original one, uh, whichever one that came from my great grandmother. And I displaced them from the natural environment at my grandparents' house and planted them uh, quote unquote, in this uh, soil-like medium, which is actually blended paper pulp. And I made the paper pulp from books that contain information, uh, which can be in alignment with my own views of my background um, or biased information about colonization and that era of history, which I've combined together and blended all together to create um, basically what is a thick piece of paper on the floor. And you can see pieces of text by the iris plant there on the bottom. And I left this outside to weather over time and they're still gathering energy from what is stored in the rhizome. So they're still technically like growing over time which is why they're still green. And yeah, I think that's it. I want to ask you a question regarding this piece. Um, how did you, how do you make trans transform the book pages into the pulp? Sure. So basically, I go out and I find all the books that interest me in some way. So, like I said, they have some kind of biased information, or they have specific information about my background and how that relates to me. And I'll take the bindings off of the books and strip down any kind of glue binding that may be residual on the paper. Um, and then I'll either soak the paper over time to help break it down, or I will physically tear each page apart um, until they're all small pieces. And then I'll let that soak for a good amount of time until the paper is broken down enough to be blended. And then I just have like a kitchen immersion blender and I'll use that in a big bucket and blend the paper pulp together until it's almost an even consistency. Hmm. So I kind of assume that, you know, some when some of the words are legible, I think there's just more like a, more like a chance, like a, just risk, like you don't really chose which ones you kind of want them to pop out. You maybe some of them yeah. pop out unintentionally is that correct yeah um previous works to this i actually did place certain information so that it was less legible and became more significant but in this piece i believe it was entirely chance as to what is you know more emphasized in the piece and i think i just poured the paper pulp out onto the screen and whatever is laying on the surface was completely by chance Mm -hmm. The reason why I picked your pieces in this exhibition, because I just thought, I think your pieces are the most humble and reserved to where people, I think a lot of people just go through the exhibit and thought like, oh, they're just, 
they're just plants on the shelf they're just plants on the floor and even like some people just kind of comment oh they're just just like artistic debris <laughs> you know they just didn't really thought too much about these works in the exhibit because the other ones are really really like grand they're bold they're colorful but when you see something these this natural and people just kind of overlook it. It is does play off your your practice concerning how a lot of these plants that aren't indigenous to the to the land we live in right now, but then it comes so natural life that we just we just never really thought about it or didn't think too much about the history. So it's just the the, the humility of your works. It, I think is it the, also the conceptual strength. I think is that's why I kind of chose it. Yeah. And I liked what you were saying earlier, too, about, you know, during COVID, it kind of led everyone outside to, you know, explore their surroundings and their environment. And that really, you know, that I, I did the same thing. I was going outside, looking at my surroundings, and, you know, these things started coming to my mind, like, well, this isn't, this plant was brought here by somebody. It wouldn't, you know, it exists here for a certain reason. And so that really led to a lot of the work that I'm making now because of that and because of, you know, me having to stay at home and realize all of these things in my garden and how that relates to me personally. I kind of want to shift gears a little bit and expand towards your overall practice. You kind of had a, considering me, like I have a scientific background, I really, a lot of the things you did are very laboratory kind of experimental focus. So can you, when did you start like, want to transition from a, from just like a general artistic practice to something a little bit more like scientific? When did you start having this shift in your practice? Um, I think it was probably when I was at UTA pursuing a glass degree. Um, glass is a very, or it can be a very scientific medium, you know, blowing beakers and things like that. It can be, you know, I can go down a scientific path with that. And I really started to look at glass as a vessel and what that means, you know, in a lab setting. And I slowly started incorporating plants just because I enjoyed it um, and my undergraduate journey. And I think when I went into grad school, it just kind of exploded. Like, I really enjoy this scientific speculation of things, looking at things closely, and everything that comes with science and observing something and how I can incorporate that into my work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, unfortunately, we don't have any glass pieces here, but I kind of liked, instead of your other pieces that you had in your studio, they're more like encapsulated in these mini micro environment, but I like this more open, yeah, nonchalant kind of feel in your works. Um, Maddie, do you have anything else you want to talk about your works? No, I think that's all. Well, thank you, Maddie, so much for sharing with us and contributing to the show. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to move to Carla Garcia. Carla Garcia is a Mexican, more American-based artist that creates installations and sculptures with clay found objects and other materials sim symbolic to her Mexican heritage and migration. Carla's current body work is part of her home and land project, which includes a series of cacti forms inspired by, by the desert landscape of her home at the US-Mexico border. She uses terracotta clay to create organic forms inspired by the way physical or environmental obstacles alter the growth of the cacti. The cactus is a part of the Mesoamerican cultural iconography, as well as the Chihuahua, Texas landscape. Hi, Carla. Hello. Okay, Carla, can you please tell us more about your installation? Yeah, so like you said, um, this, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, this body of work is uh, started as an exploration um, of the cacti forms displaced from their environment. Um, I started to make them at home and I started to photograph them um, in my home setting. Uh, the way that I was making them and then just moving them around at home just sort of uh, became this uh, sort of um, 
a way to look at identity and a way to look at history and migration. The cactus, as you know, it's uh, it's symbolic to Mexico. And um, I just chose my own cactus that I'm familiar with, which is the feral cactus. And then I started to think about how they change when there's uh, either an obstacle or an environmental shift and how they just maybe shrink or shrivel a little bit and then they grow again um, and that just affects their growth. And I started to make these in this way. So I would imagine how would this cactus change if it had like different ways of changing throughout time, like what happens when you migrate from one country to the other and everything changes. And so they, they're just, the, their forms are based on those sort of um, connections and the, that dialogue of uh, displacement, of moving um, journeys and individuality, each one is different. And they are um, also kind of like a vessel, they're coil built and uh, they're hollow. And so they, they also kind of have that uh, connection to, to humanity and also to vessels um, to speak of the human condition. So when I exhibited this at, at a, the Nasher window series, I had these cacti set up on the floor, uh, similar to this, but they were separated as units, as individuals. And I had a, a video with photographs of my home and how they were sort of uh, just put in different places and how I, I found dialogues in different ways about the connection of my home here in Dallas and that history that comes from Mexico, not only cultural history, but also personal history that I'm bringing with me and it's part of me every day. Um, and so for this exhibition, I, I stripped it down to only have the cacti and only talk about um, the land and the space in which they grow. Um, and I think in this way, um, it, it has that um, connotation of, uh, of migration um, in the desert and how difficult that is for some people. And, and just, I wanted to kind of uh, talk about that a little bit. And, and, and these, are, these are unique pieces and they are, you know, they're not perfect. They're meant to show um, the hand and how they were made in, in some sort of um, the way that they, they shift and they, they just kind of shrivel in these parts. Um, it talks about trauma, it talks about um, just difficult situations that you have to adapt um, as, you know, as human beings. And when they're placed in, in this just kind of desolate space, you know, it, there is just the land and then it's, it's this cacti there. It's not only about is it's not only about the um, it's not only about the beauty of the landscape of the desert, but it's about the hardships of the desert as well, and of migration issues. I just I, I really like that some of them were like the vessels you mentioned that they they were even though outside is kind of disfigured and twisted and a lot of turning, um, but there's like you can have these vessels kind of hold water. So I thought about like how you mentioned all the difficulties of migration to this arid desolate landscape, but you have all these, these vessels that hold life. So it's kind of like these, it's kind of like, I like this dichotomy between these two. I would like you to explain, Carla, the, the reasons why you left it on fire and why you didn't want to add color to the pieces. Yeah, so I didn't want to add any color to add any specificity of my own culture um, and like my personal culture or, or, or my Mexican culture, which is, you know, typically you see a lot of color, a lot of brightness. And for these, it was more about just sort of that core emotion and that core uh, humanity that I wanted to talk about. So I stripped it away from color. I didn't add any detail of um, the cactus uh, needles or the spines um, and just left them bare and left them minimal and and they sort of speak of fragility and being um, yeah of being fragile and that's why I left them unfired as well um, without firing them the, it's just about the earth 
it is, you know, they are made of mud. They're made of when they're completely dry, it is basically just, just dust, you know, that that's held together and they're ephemeral. So um, if one of them breaks, it, it can be remade. It, it doesn't, you know, it's not lost forever. So there's that, that kind of aspect of, it's not final, you know? Mm-hmm. So, so yeah, so the, the, the reason that I left them on fire is to speak of um, ephemeral qualities of clay and fragility um, and also of uh, possibility. Mm-hmm. It seems like, you know, that's kind of shifting to your studio, but it seems like you have a whole garden <laughs> in your house because like, I feel like this making so, so many of these that I feel like it's this whole, its own cacti garden, even though it's just so bare and so vulnerable without these spikes and without this color. It just, you can, I feel like it's just more implied like life. You, you just think more about the life that it, it has and went through, but it's not, it takes some imagination from the viewer just just look at these and 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 kind of think of what it actually looks like in real life, but you're also in your exhibit. So it it does take something more, more imagination. But even though it, I just like, you have a lot of these going on and building. And we did we did play also with the sand, the sand and the lighting. So if you go to the exhibit in person, you just really one strong lighting, in the in the show. So it'd be like almost like the sun almost like so it's kind of like an asymmetrical lighting when but the other parts is kind of darker mm-hmm. so we were, it's very like ambient with the with the whole um the showing of the this particular work so carla do you have anything else you want to share with us before we um, move yeah i mean the lighting is very important to me and how i display my works and i did want to have the natural lighting um resemble a natural space um yeah but uh yeah no that's it uh, i'm I, I i'm still making cacti at home and um i will keep you posted on where they go <laughs> <laughs> and i also like to say i think you are very detail oriented with the with the shadows because i think with other works that i have i have worked with you in other exhibits seen them and i think you're very particular with how the shadows or cast. So that's how I noticed about your body of work. So you're like, I wanted the chat to be this way, but I was like, okay, yeah. you have some, have some thinking going on with how you want to p- portray your work. So I thought, I thought that's a really interesting aspect of your pieces. But thank you so much, Carla, for showing your work and having, having you in the show. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna move on to Molly Valentine Dirks. So Molly Valentine Dirks is a visual artist and designer. Dirks' practice is interdisciplinary in nature, combining a background in sculpture, design, and studies in psychology, disability theory, gender theory, and architecture with her love of different media, from sound to poetry and literature to dance. Through her detailed installations that merge the formal languages of technology and nature, she explores evolving landscapes of intimacy and connection. Hi, Molly. <clears throat> so Molly, can you please tell us about your skin hunger installation? Sure. Um, so this is all work that I that started basically after March. Um, and the tree series is an ongoing body of work that kind of cycles back through into my practice every few months. So I have these, um, I, I do consider myself an, an artist and a designer, but they're sort of separate hats. So um, I'll do the design side of my practice and then it usually becomes like every other show and then the tree series. And so this is, these are actually two, two sides of my practice. So the, the pieces that are on the floor are more my design-based work. So I have an idea of what something's going to look like and then I go through the process of constructing it. And a lot of times that that process um, will mimic what I think of as maybe making conditions in like the industrial world. So uh, the piece on the left on the floor is about three feet wide, uh, maybe a little bit under two feet tall and it's covered in something like five or 6,000 silk flower petals that I got 
online on Amazon. I don't know who made them or where. Um, I mean, they came from China. But I, I think that's so fascinating, this, the fact that we have an entire industry around mimicking nature. Um, but of course, the process of, of putting the, the flower petals on the rock becomes almost like a factory sort of labor process. And so after a while, that's really wearing. And then I usually turn to my tree series. And, and for that series, which is in the background on the pedestals, these are a very different, um, a, like a very different process of making that's, that feels a lot more embodied in some ways, because if I need to go outside and collect branches or find natural materials, then that's, that's folded into the process. So um, there are like tiny little mushrooms that I will get off of logs and then I'll mix that with things that to me mimic nature but are absolutely um, synthetic. Uh, and a, a, a lot of the work I think is also dealing with my discomfort of like the psychopharmaceutical industry and, and kind of the way that we are distanced from our bodies. So we'll like pop a pill in order to feel better. And that's a thing that we do now. Um, or we like turn to our phone to look at an image of somebody. And so I, I think we, and I think COVID uh, really reminded us of this, but I think we have a really weird relationship with our bodies. It's very, they're like an object, a thing that's happening at a remove from who we are. And so a lot of my feelings about that are, are funneled through this work. Mm -hmm. And here's the the pieces that on the floor, kind of could. Oops. Okay. Yeah, those are pill. Those are like if you go back one image, those are actually um, like empty pill capsules that I set up. Okay, Molly. I have a question regarding the orchestration of these ikebana inspired pieces. So ikebana is the Japanese art of floor arrangements. So can you, can you tell me why you want them well, orchestrated a certain way? I think you mentioned to me in the past that they kind of talked about human relationships. Yeah, so I'm, I'm really interested. So each of these branches, they're not, I don't think there's a single branch in the whole series that's an actual branch that I found in nature. They're usually branches that are Frankenstein together to get like a really specific curvature. And so I think in this, a, a lot of what's happening in this work is the way that we, that distance between the way that we curate ourselves around other people and in particular in like, you know, like your Instagram profile or the social habits that we've learned to come across a certain way and the, the little moments between people that either break those down or reinforce those. Um, and so e each of these vignettes to me feels like the performance of a relationship between different people. And there's definitely a lot in here about my relationship in particular with my mother, I think. Um, but yeah, just kind of thinking about like the idea of like yearning or longing, but never being able to close that gap. And so a lot of these branches will sort of reach towards one another and they, it's like they want to connect, but they are somehow unable to. And I feel like that's mirrored in the way that we like deal with our phone, like even texting or um, video conferencing, it's like you're trying to close this gap and there's this technological device that's kind of in between, that's in between you and another person. Yeah, like in your, um, in these bonsai, ikibana kind of pieces, you, you have a lot of these, these like little islands. You have these kind of like you, these ones right here, these little it's accessory pieces that you do cut off like pills and plastics, but they're almost like, almost like root system, like they're communing with each other, but you have these individual plants that are almost like humans. So they're kind of like trying to talk to one another. So even when, so they're like made out of different compositions and materials, but they're almost like trying to come together to some kind of a midpoint or even have these ones on the left hand, left hand picture here, they're little just rotating and spinning in their own little space. So maybe they're just how interpreting these, these magnetic rotating pieces and maybe they're just not really going to get to that midpoint of people talking to each other or we connecting. So they have some forms of some pieces that are connecting and some there are not. They're the whole their own real world. Mm -hmm. So that's how, that's how I really enjoy these these pieces that are very colorful. Or I think there's something highly subversive about them and I think people are just more intrigued 
what you have to say, and they're really open ended. And I kind of want to touch base briefly about these pieces on Molly. I think, even though I, I do feel they're kind of, they could be standalone pieces, um, how do you think they relate to those um, Ikebana pieces, plant pieces on the podium? I think. I think they're inspired, especially the one on the right. Um, I actually sent a picture of that to my mom and she sent me back a picture of a lion's head mushroom that I had bought at a farmer's market in North Carolina and they look really similar. And I hadn't, I hadn't even really realized that as I was making it, but um, I think the forms in general are just inspired by forms in nature. And so I, I think of these big like skin, they're kind of like skin lumps. Mm -hmm. um and so, so the reason that i called it skin hunger is because there's a there's a phenomenon of like where if you don't get touch enough there's a, you, you develop a psychological hunger for touch like it's a soothing thing that we all need uh but i also think that we're getting away from that that we don't necessarily value things like touch or embodied experiences and so i, I when i was creating this piece i was thinking about how with the flower petal piece you really want to pet it but it's also like this big art object on the floor so you're sort of there's a sense that you're not supposed to do that and that tension of really wanting to touch or hold something and and not really being able to well molly do you have anything else you want to share with us before we move on no, I just, I'm, I'm really enjoying hearing about people's experiences of like embodiment and disembodiment in this e exhibition. Well, thank you so much, Molly, for your works in the show and I greatly appreciate your insights. Thank you so much. Thank you. So now we're going to move on to Lene Bowman Cravens. Lene Bowman Cravens is a fine art photographer living in Texas. She received a BA in photo communications from St. Edwards University and her MFA in photography from University of North Texas. She takes a wide range of approaches in her artwork as a response to the autobiographical narrative. The work is poetic and expressive, revealing a glimpse into her desires through contemporary self-portraiture. Each piece and series range from, uh, from large-scale digital installations to delicate one-of-a-kind objects. Hello, Lene. Hey, how's it going? Good, good. So I know, we, I know your works, your installation has like distinct pieces that could be standalone body of works, but could you just tell us the overall th thought process in all of this, the total installation? Sure. Um, so yes, these are from multiple bodies of work. Uh, so the mirror pieces are from another body of work that's not related to nature initially. Um, and then the fabric origami pieces are kind of my um, step into what I would call landscape, uh, which is very not the type of work I make. So thank you for including me in this exhibition. <laughs> um, but you know, when uh, Narang approached me about being in the show, I initially thought, oh yes, the fabric origami pieces, those will make a lot of sense. And then the more I was kind of thinking about um, everyone else's work in the show and what I've seen of their work prior to us installing, I was also interested in creating a, like a landscape in the show as well. Um, and kind of thinking about how to do that through the pieces that I present to Narong to potentially show. And so, you know, the fabric, the sheer fabric panels in this space, I initially thought of that from a show that I'd done before uh, with another artist, Jesse Barnes, that was um, based around nature. And that's where the fabric tessellation pieces originated from. But we had done a fabric installation as well, where we, um, uh, laser cut some fabric, we hand dyed things. I did print a few, because uh, these are photographic prints on sheer fabric that I made. Um, and so that was kind of like the first experience of like, okay, let's make an actual full installation. And so with this, I wanted to kind of continue that idea of like adding to the space and create a landscape inside of the gallery with my work. Um, and then the mirror pieces come into that because with that work, even though it is the body that you're primarily seeing in this, it becomes like another dimension, like another landscape that's unreachable because of this, you know, glass mirror substrate. Um, but, you know, looking at the pieces, they're photographs of my body parts that I've, you know, taken Photoshop to create these compositions and then had printed on glass or a mirror. Um, but as a viewer, when you're looking at it, you are reflected into the piece. So you become part of that composition. And so with the installation overall, I was wanting to 
reflect the installation in the pieces. So you kind of end up with this landscape of the sheer panels and other artworks. Um, so like the one, the optic yield piece, you can see Molly's pieces reflected into it. So you're kind of getting not just my work, but everyone else's work who's in that kind of reflected field. Um, and with my work, I primarily focus on the body and kind of my experiences and ideas and trying to express that through, you know, photographs of my body and distorting it through Photoshop, origami, uh, some sort of manipulation through layering. Um, and for this show, it was, I wanted to, I did want to bring that into the show since that is primarily what my work is about. So that was one reason I wanted to include these pieces. Um, but all the photographic work that is of nature is actually from uh, a trip I took to Panama. I guess that's been three and a half years ago, um, which is, you know, such an unusual landscape for me. I'm from born and raised in Texas. So the rainforest is just such a unusual landscape for me and it was interesting because there's plants and animals and things that you've never seen before in our Texas landscape and then there's things that are very familiar because we're not you know there are some plants that do both what do well in both of our climates so you end up with some trees and plants that you do see around here so you know kind of thinking about migration patterns and things like that um, especially with these two pieces um, so Mercur uh, Mercurial Company is just photographs I took of birds. Um, that is like the big um, attraction to Panama. The two things you do is you go birding and you zip line. Um, and we went during the rainy season. So it was not good for birding where you're actually photographing birds and trying to get these really beautiful images. Um, as an artist, I'm like, I just want to take pictures of birds in a way that's maybe not what you're trying to get for, you know, your bird collection of photographs. Um, so this is photoshopped again so uh photographs of birds coming to eat um and i don't know exactly what all of these uh breeds of bird are i could definitely start looking them up uh but i'm less concerned about with those details than kind of creating this frenzy of what it felt like with the feeding that was happening and even though these aren't one photograph it's same with the other piece the other one has been photoshopped to put more butterflies into the piece but it kind of is uh, embodying what I felt in that time, in that moment, and kind of my memories of that moment. And um, I make a lot of work about memories. And so memories are weird because they're, they're important to us. We remember things, but the more you remember stuff, the more you distort that memory. And the more that, and memories aren't necessarily reliable. So it's kind of trying to draw emotion out of those memories and create something that's realistic for my memories, but not necessarily representational of what was happening. Yeah, I, I really want to just play off your, you know, statements regarding memory being a predominant theme in your words, because I think you have a lot of these pieces that are they're shared, they're transparent, so you really try to look at something, but you kind of look through it, but not really directly at it, and you kind of have pieces that are bouncing back at you, and you have pieces there where you kind of look at it, it's, it's kind of a lot of repetition, and almost like, or it's with the origami pieces, so it's not really it's not really a clear image in the end of the day, but you try to pull out things from your head. It's never, it's never gonna be the same direct transcription from what you saw yesterday. So they're, right. they're, just, they're just almost like, they're not really quite what it, what it appears to be. That's why I really like the, the dynamics of the pieces you have here. Even with the, even with these mirror pieces, I thought even yesterday about like the body, the figure, but I really, I really thought they were just more like stems or pollen or like trees or roots. So I think it, it could be, it could play, it, it plays off each other, especially you have these kind of frenzy going on. So you have these like human plants, human limbs that look like plants. So you have these, this like, this oversaturation of imagery in front of you with nature and you have these sheer fabrics. So I think yes, there there could be great standalone pieces, but overall it just it just more like a almost like a circle of life cyclical kind of like dynamic between all these sets you have. It's like almost like a a giant play you have you're having with even though you have different scenes going on. Right. Yeah, I wanted there to be it. You know, the pieces can kind of be by themselves and they can live in their own series of work and in those ideas, but. You know, I remember one of my professors 
saying, you know, as an artist, you make work about one or two things your entire career. And I remember at the time being like, no, like that's no, I make lots of work. And the older I've gotten, I'm like, oh no, I make work about like one thing, but it just comes across physically in different ways with different imagery. And, you know, I think this was a really interesting opportunity to kind of find re like put some work from different bodies of work into one show under a theme that's maybe not what some of it normally I would have thought it went under but it totally fits as far as this overall um exhibition and the new mirror piece uh cascade is really interesting because I've been wanting to make that piece for years and it actually came from the show the composition came from the exhibition I did with Jesse Barnes um and you can actually see this is the original composition um, cause in the installation, we wanted to put the body parts in the fabric installation that we did, which was a mixture of, uh, unstretched canvas. She had painted sheer fabric, uh, photograph fabric that we did. And by the time we finished all that, we're like, well, we don't need any of the limbs. Like we think we feel like, like it's done, which was a really nice spot for us, but I'd kind of already cut these out and just laid them on the ground in preparation for peeling the back off to put the sheer arms and legs into the show and I was like I really like how this looked and so I took this picture and I've been like someday I need a refoto because these are from old photographs um and they weren't high enough quality to blow up to the size of the final mirror pieces so I was like I have to go refotograph it at some point um but it, it's interesting because it does kind of remind me of like a, a clump of vines hanging down or like a tree with moss and, or even like a waterfall. That's why, you know, the name of this one cascade kind of comes from um, those ideas of things cascading down. Um, and when you, you had mentioned that Narang during one of our studio visits and I was like, oh, that makes so much sense to me, um, which was one reason you decided to go with this image versus some of the other mirror pieces I had. So, um, it's great to have those dialogues, I think, with you as a curator and then seeing all the other work and having this uh, almost aha moment about work that you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't notice this. Like it's probably been there because of where this composition came out of was the only other you know, nature-based thing I've done, but it's like, I didn't see it for the, however many years this has been pinned up on my studio wall waiting for me to make this piece. So um, yeah, I love these opportunities to kind of readdress work and look back at it again and put it in a different context because I learned so much more about the work and myself and the work that I'm trying to make. I mean, of course, I think I think when you're in different shows and different curators, they, you kind of they kind of reinvent your work as your art, as the artist. So you kind of see like, oh, maybe your work talked about identity, or but you kind of could maybe translate to a nature show kind of like this, or maybe something, or maybe both, or can, I feel like a sculpture show, or it, it feels like your work, even though you might have like options in your head, but really that's why a lot of people with different characters come in, they, they can really reinvent your work and see how they can fit into different themes. So I think that a lot of the works here, uh, it, it has many options and the limitation, like it's very really unlimited. So I think it, that's why it kind of shows these pieces and they're all fabulous. Um, since we didn't receive any questions from the audience, I'd like to just ask Lene one last question. Um, how do you come up with the composition of origami piece? Because it looks so labor intensive. It's super labor intensive. Um, and it depends on what I'm doing, uh, especially with these two, the composition uh, with the origami pattern is very intentional. Um, and that's not always the case. I sometimes like to leave it to be very um, haptic and just pick an image based on, you know, the form I'm trying, the final form I'm trying to create, which is the origami pattern. And I'll just let it happen and see what folds and what doesn't fold and um, what's hidden and what's not hidden. I'm really interested in, you know, those things I've made other bodies of work about hiding things and then revealing things based around the origami pattern. Um, but with this series, you know, I thought it was interesting to really try and lean into being more purposeful with the print of the fabric. Um, and so like with the bird, uh, Makuro company, the original one, I had made it um, way more symmetrical with, you know, full bird bodies being in the spaces in between the folds. And um, I had printed out on paper and, you know, cut out what was going to be visible and glued it together in my sketchbook. And I was like, I hate it. I absolutely hate it. And I spent so long uh, cutting the birds out digitally so that, you know, cause they're Photoshopped into this piece. So they're not on, they're not all in the same image. So that took hours of time just to do that. And so it was kind of being like, okay, well, why do I like the ones that 
the images I've made in the past where something's hidden because it wants you to kind of keep exploring and you have this uneasiness, I think, when you look at those disruptions where like a head should be or a wing is not in the right place or something's hidden and you don't see the full object. Um, so like on this one in the kind of uh, left bottom corner, that red body, like you just barely get a little foot, but you don't get the bird's head and things like that. And so you're kind of want to see more, but you know, I've hidden that from you. So you don't get to see that. So I like those kind of moments of, you know, you don't always see the part of the bird you want to see. Like if you've ever photographed or looked at birds, it's like, they like to, they're moving. They don't care about what we see. Um, and then with the new piece sisters, um, this one was less planned in a way because I was not as concerned with keeping, you know, parts of the tree intact. But so this is primarily one image I took, but all I did was I went into all the photographs I had from this section and cut the butterflies out of all these different photographs and duplicated them and put them throughout the image thinking, okay, I'd like one on this swirl and I'd like one to be kind of in this flap. And so again, kind of making decisions about seeing the full butterfly or having part of it cut off or, and if you're seeing the piece in person, you know, you can kind of lean to look behind a flap to see a little bit more of the image. Um, which is one thing I do like about my work when it's installed is that experience of being there and physically looking at it and how that, you know, having the sheer fabric, it's so like thin when you walk past it, it waves and like moves and kind of that ethereal experience, but it's also something you can only experience being there, like us looking at it now, it's not going to move. Um, so having those kind of moments that are special to you as a viewer, where you're having an experience that you can't have online. Thank you so much, Lene, for sharing us with your works. And it's such a pleasure having your pieces in the installation. Even though we did not receive um, live card audience Q&A, I had my email and my Instagram page. So if you have any questions about the show and uh, any individual questions for art for the artists, I'll be more than happy to connect you to them. And Human Nature is up until January 16th. And so you only have a week left, less than a week left. So it'll be up until Saturday. Well, uh, thank you so much for working with Arthur again for having us. And it was such a pleasure working with everybody with the center. And thank you so much to the totally amazing fabulous artists. We definitely, definitely hear more from you soon and keep making more works. And I greatly appreciate your contribution, your energy and your dedication to exhibit. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have, well, have a fabulous weekend and we'll see you all soon. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.